to be here and to be a part of this. Uh, you know, I'm somewhat new to the Moon Society and just the last couple uh, month and a half to help to uh, coordinate this effort on your behalf has, has really been terrific and really eye opening. So uh, I've always been a moon nerd, but this is kind of a different angle on it for me. So I, I'm really enjoying this. So thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> with that, I am going to start some of the, the content of our meeting. I've been involved with space research of one kind or another for 20 years. Um, and it has been uh, amazing, profound, the changes over the last 20 years. Um, talking about the moon was uh, not cool 20 years ago. I mean, there was, there was a little bit of interest um, from some administrations at some points, but there hasn't really been sustained interest in the moon for a long time. And that feels like we're at kind of a new uh, tipping point uh, for lunar development. And I'm very excited about that. Um, by, uh, by way of background, um, I think that I think that if you look at the last 20 years and then look forward another, 15 years, uh, I think there's going to be a lot that changes. I think this is a kind of um, a pivotal time in human history that kind of feels like what I imagine the Renaissance might have been once upon a time, uh, where people's perceptions of their, the world that they live in is, is either radically changing or has already radically changed. Uh, and my role in this has been uh, to think about big ideas, big projects. Um, I started out uh, on the original NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts research team for the space elevator. And while that has changed a lot over that time, um, about about four years ago, five years ago, I really, really switched gears to focus on a lunar elevator. So that's when I started paying more attention to the moon. Well, I'm gonna talk about that a lot more tomorrow, but this is the starting point for me. Um, it was about a year ago, uh, the National Space Council came out with a really powerful document about where we are as an as the as the United States, and where we could maybe be going um, as a nation. Now, I want to point out that this is not uh, the Moon Society is not an American centric organization. It welcomes folks from all over the world, um, absolutely. Uh, and as you get to know me, I, I'm I'm involved with the International Space University, so I'm definitely a globalist. Uh, but I think this document is super important, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link in the chat uh, afterwards. It's it's worth reading. It's not very long, 23, 27 pages, something like that. Um, but it lays the foundation for where the United States has decided to go, and it's it's important to note that while this was a document of the past administration. Uh, it has been so far accepted and continued by the current administration. So uh, I have high hopes for it. Um, you know, I know that things change in DC frequently, but the National Space Council has been reinstated. Um, many of the directions that uh, were established um, over the last uh, four years and before that, eight years ago, uh, many of those ideals that focus on commercialization have been um, maintained currently. And that's really good news, I think. Um, so the document talks about you know, five major elements, commercialization at LEO, returning to the moon to stay, extending humans to Mars, 
deep space science and education and workforce. Uh, those are the big themes of it. The ones we're gonna really pay attention to are commercialization of LEO and returning to the moon to stay. Um, these ideas to me seem pretty straightforward, almost self-evident, uh, but to have them come out as national doctrine and then the ripple effects that came from that, uh, it's called the new era document. The ripple effects that came out of that new era document, uh, we're still feeling. Um, there was an event that was held about this time last year. Uh, well, no, I guess it was in May last year that, uh, that a lot of very smart people got together and started thinking about the immediate future. And, and I think if I counted correctly, eight different national policy documents were formed from that, from that event. And, and this is one of them, or at least, you know, uh, language in this was one of them. Um, some of the other ripple effects uh, pushed policy into the um, other into other places in uh, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Education, Department of Commerce. Uh, so you know these documents, when they're crafted, uh, have have ripple effects. They they have powerful ripple effects, and it's really great to kind of see that happening. Um, the guy on the left here is uh, retired General Quast, three-star General Quast from the Air Force. Um, he was a strong advocate for the development of U.S. Space Force. And to not pull his, his quotes out of context, he's saying that the conversations we're having around space right now uh, might truly be some of the most important conversations in our nation's history. And I, and I pushed him on that. I asked him some questions about that. And what he's saying was, you know, since the founding of this country, we had to make some really important decisions. But for most of it, for most of the last nearly 250 years, um, things have kind of gone along in some sort of steady state you know there's been innovation and there's change of course we all know that but that the changes that we are about to face the, the decisions that we're about to make uh, might influence the next 250 years of our nation's future and i i thought that was pretty interesting uh you know he's a he's an he's an air force general with um a focus on educating uh, air, senior Air Force leaders. And, and so if he's talking about you know, this interesting future, it does make me kind of pay attention. Uh, and so that was, that was, that was pretty powerful. Um, and then this other guy on the right is not very well known. His name is uh, Dr. Joel Mosier. He is the chief scientist of the US Space Force. And it's his actual job to look into the future and decide what are we looking at? Now, he's coming from a national security threat perspective. So, you know, he definitely has a bias about, you know, what are, what are things that the United States needs to be concerned about? So, you know, that, that's his professional bias and that's his job. So, um, you know, I understand where he's coming from, but what he has been working towards uh, over the last maybe three or four years, even prior to uh, Space Force being officially stood up, was to understand what the next 60 years look like. Sorry, uh, 2060, the next 40 years. That's when the document was written. Uh, it was 2020. Uh, what does the next 40 years in space look like to 2060? And uh, you know, working backwards from that, uh, what does the next 15 years look like to 2035-ish? Uh, and that's a, that, you know, no one has a crystal ball. So, um, 
you know, that's very hard to do. And it's, it's fascinating to me that the Air Force at the time, space, U.S. Space Command that's transitioned to the U.S. Space Force was looking at the moon, right? Um, the, the Chinese National Space Program, CNSA, uh, CSNA, um, has always been a military program. Um, the, the program that we usually enjoy in the United States is a civilian run program of NASA and then uh, to a far lesser degree, um, DOD, Department of Defense involvement. Whereas in China, it's, it's entirely the opposite. There's very limited uh, civil space, there's becoming some commercial space. Uh, and so as China has had a space force effectively for a very long time, and as the United States and Japan and uh, France have all developed their space forces really in the last three years or so, um, it is interesting that uh, an aspect that we hardly ever think about, Department of Defense, thinking about the moon, that that could have some really interesting, uh, maybe unintended consequences. Uh, it, it might be great. Uh, I, I'm really, I think the verdict is still out and it will be for a long time. But I guess I'm pointing this out because there is a role of government, whether it's Department of Energy, whether it's uh, Department of Education, uh, and of course, uh, NASA and DOD and, and those folks, there is a role in, of government that uh, makes space possible. Uh, it's a catalyst. Uh, sometimes it's called a, uh, uh, a lighthouse client that is pointing to safe paths, uh, safe shipping lanes. Um, sometimes it's referred to as an anchor tenant. Uh, certainly it is for the International Space Station. But there's other stuff happening. So the role of government, uh, maybe I have a personal bias that maybe I don't want it to be quite as influential as it is, but it is one of the primary, if not the primary drivers for uh, the near future. And it's this constant, constant, constant cycle of current programs being replaced by potential programs. And there's there's always budgetary management, there's always question marks. Uh, it feels like the, the, the most important game in Washington DC these days is uh, the fight between current programs and potential programs. Um, I tend to look at space from the perspective of kind of, you know, one lens with four filters. Right. If we're going to do space, whether it's lunar development, LEO development, whatever it might be, um, I look at it from the perspective of kind of four filters. Uh, almost everybody, almost all the time, focuses on hardware. Um, we're going to do it at this at this event. Uh, we've got basically the whole day tomorrow talking about habitation on the moon. Um, Hardware is fun. It's fun to talk about. I, I, I'm a big nerd. I like uh, I like space stations and I like rockets and and uh, you know I like I like uh, you know environmental control and life support systems at, at the really kind of systems of systems level. Uh, hardware is some of the stuff that inspires us, right? It's it's what we get great pictures of. Uh, I got to tell you, I've seen some of the imagery. For habitation tomorrow and it really is quite amazing and beautiful um, but less focused on but equally important are the other elements business outreach and framework um, how do we pay for it on my last slide i was talking about budgets at, at the dc level and and the other governments that have the same budgetary problems and, and questions um that's one way to pay for it is government 
support. Another way to pay for it is uh, private capital. And we're gonna be talking about later about that uh, quite a bit later today uh, and a bit tomorrow. Uh, there's a flood of new money flowing into the system. And that's really exciting too. Uh, so that's something to kind of pay attention to. How do you pay for your hardware? How do you pay for the team that puts that together and maintains it and operates it? What are your operational and management processes? Uh, you know, what's your what's your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and opportunities and threats? Right. So that is all encompassed, and it's often ignored. Now it's been getting a lot of attention maybe in the last three to five years, but uh, I'm gonna butcher this quote, but I, I, think, it, I think it came from uh, uh, Gene Cernan, although I'm not sure of that, but one of the, one of the lines of early NASA folklore was, uh, uh, with no bucks, you've got no Buck Rogers. And while I might have butchered that quote, the sentiment is really straightforward. If you can't pay for it, you don't get to build the rest of the stuff you want to build. So it's not as glamorous as maybe the rest of the hardware, but it's certainly a vital element. And then outreach, what I call storytelling. Uh, this event, what we're hosting right now, is a part of that outreach, right? It's outreach for the Moon Society, but it's also outreach rich, writ large of the space community to the non-space community or to the Moon Society, a segment of the space community. And outreach can happen in a lot of different ways. It's everything from these sort of conferences to STEM education in the sixth grade to um, uh, global summits where heads of nations and heads of space agencies meet and plan for the future. And then finally, another section that's often, often, often overlooked and ignored is the legal policy and regulatory framework that makes all of this stuff possible. If governments are currently the primary drivers for space, the laws and policies and regulations of those governments certainly has influence and power over most of those decisions. Uh, even eventually when commercial drivers are the primary drivers in space, they still have to operate within the framework of uh, regulations and policies. So, um, you know, uh, uh, the Martian, um, uh, with Mark Watney from, from the, Mar the movie The Martian was talking about space piracy. And uh, I, got a, I got a real chuckle out of that because Someday, someday down the road, space piracy is going to be a thing. And uh, I don't think it's a thing yet, but, but it will be a thing someday. And so those, that framework lays the foundation for that future, hopefully without pirates. Um, I also break the actors in space into uh, kind of four sections. I jokingly refer to it as ACDC because I'm, you know, 53 year old rocker that liked ACDC. Um, academic, civil, defense, and commercial. Those are the primary actors in this space. Um, it started out as a primarily academic exercise, which is why I put it first. Um, Eventually, civil got involved, uh, defense and commercial. Commercial is definitely a late player uh, to, to the sector. Um, yes, of course, uh, Boeing and Lockheed Martin were, were deeply involved in the earliest days of the Apollo program, but uh, their role in developing space uh, has, has shifted pretty dramatically. So that's how I kind of frame the actors, and I, I, there are a lot of nonprofits. Obviously, the Moon Society is one of those nonprofits. Uh, I usually lump them in with the civil crowd. Um, that's not a it's not a perfect fit, but um, uh, it it fits a little bit. So, given those actors, 
given that there's national policy for the United States that other nations are also uh, enacting or, or similar rules, um, given the actors, given the lens to kind of look at the problems, this is where we're going. I, this is where I think we're going. Um, uh, there's kind of six big elements to it. We're really, really, really good at launch now. It's taken a long time. It's taken a really long time, but we've gotten very, very good at launch. Um, on average, we're launching a rocket. Like the world is launching a rocket to space about every three days. Somewhere in the world, somebody's firing off a rocket. I think that is astounding. I, I really do. Like just kind of let that sink in for a second. We're launching a rocket about every three days somewhere in the world. And not everybody's going to get the attention that, that, that SpaceX craves. And they've got, a, they've got a media machine that is highly tuned to their audience. But there's a whole lot of other rocketry happening beyond, beyond SpaceX. And, and if you can do launch really well in almost a routine manner, then communications and observation become an, an immediate uh, effect of being able to launch regularly and consistently. Uh, and so we have seen, when I started 40 years ago, there were less than 400 active satellites. Uh, last quarter, uh, sorry, the first quarter of 2021, uh, we launched over 700 satellites. Now, most of them are small. When I started, most satellites were, were big like a desk, big like a, a van, uh, a minivan. Uh, now, you know, they're the size of a thermos sometimes, right? So, uh, you know, the form factors have changed. But I think we've got a really good handle on launch communications and observation. Like, we know how to do that really well. We went from an environment of 400 active satellites to 4,000 active satellites now and we have a near future target of north of 40,000 satellites. The Satellite Industry Association uh, predicts that 90 to 110,000 satellites will be constructed in the next 10 years. A lot of them are going to replace current constellations and some of them will never be constructed. So Dr. Brian Whedon last month uh, told us that, told me that uh, he was anticipating 40,000 active satellites. So I think checkbox, we got that. So then once, you, once you've got a lot of launch and comms and observation satellites, then you're gonna start doing something that's somewhat new. The idea of space tugs has been around for a really long time, uh, but it's only been kind of uh, it's only been lately in the last year or so that you could really act on that vision. There are, I believe, four space transport in space transport companies out there now, uh, and there are there are many more on their way. Um, why are there so many? Because there's over 150 known uh, tracked launch companies. So those launch companies are going to send a lot of satellites up. Not all those satellites are going to get where they want to go because of the ride share component of their launch vehicle. So they will use in-space transportation to get somewhere else from where they started to where they want to be in orbit. And whether that's LEO or GEO or even to the uh, cislunar environment uh, of the Lagrange points or even all the way to the moon. So that's coming. It's 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 like near term. There's some of it happening already. There's more of it on its way. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the lunar elevator infrastructure. So we're going to talk about that a lot tomorrow. So I'm going to skip over it a little bit now. I will tell you that I think it's a vital element of in space cislunar infrastructure. So I'm excited about that. There are going to be a lot of space stations constructed. Uh, you know, uh, 
a month ago, there were only six astronauts orbiting the world. And two weeks ago, we had some more flights from, from chi uh, Chinese Taikonauts. And now we've gone from six to nine. Uh, that's probably our current uh, limit. It's probably in our, our maximum threshold right now, but that's our current limit. Um, but I don't think it's very far away till we double to having 18, you know, semi-permanent uh, astronaut slots on orbit. I don't think that's very far away. Uh, there are other nations considering partnering with China, China and the International Space Station on their various assets. And there's a lot of talk about commercial space stations being constructed. Um, uh, Axiom is by far the, the farthest along, but by no means they are not the full story. Uh, I still have some hope for the now closed Bigelow Aerospace. I hope that they closed only because of COVID last year, and I hope that they restart. They have some pretty powerful technology uh, behind them. But I think we're going to see an awful lot of space stations constructed soon. Once you've got that infrastructure, then you can then you can tar start talking about mining and manufacturing, orbital manufacturing, and harvesting resources from both the moon and eventually asteroids. And that is further down the road, but kind of an inevitable consequence of developing the moon and developing space stations to their full potential. And ultimately, if you can do all of those things and you do them well, uh, because all of this takes mastery, this, there's no amateurs up in space. Um, if you can do all of those things well, I believe you're gonna start uh, harvesting resources from the moon to build enormous solar panels that are then brought back to geo orbit and power the top 300 cities of the world. If you can power the top 300 cities of the world, then you can power with clean, green, limitless energy, you can power 40% of the global population. And I think that is, uh, I think that is worth striving for. So I think this is how our next 15 years are gonna unfold. It's going to be clunky, it's going to be hard, there are going to be missteps, but I think that's where we're going.